good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We want to invite you after that video play to our Christmas Eve service tomorrow evening at 5 p.m. And we're going to begin at 5. We'll be out by 6 so that you can get to your family uh, obligations and gatherings and things. And, but we want you to make that a part of your day if you can uh, possibly do that. You don't have to dress up. I'm not going to wear a tie, but uh, you can it'd kind of be a casual deal. And, uh, but we want you to come if you can. Many years ago, early in ministry, or even when, before I knew I was going to be in the ministry, every once in a while in church we would do this thing that I didn't like. And I, I just sort of promised that I won't ever do this if I'm ever in charge. And that is a responsive reading. And, uh, but I run across one the other day that I liked. And so good Lord has a way of doing this to me through the course of my life, and that's causing you to eat your words. You ever have to, ever had to do that? So I found this one, and, and, uh, and, and I wanted to do this. So I want us to stand. I'm going to read a portion, and then there will be a portion that will appear up on the screen, and Brother Eddie will kind of lead you out in, in the response to that. But, uh, but your part will, will go on the screen. It was a, light, it was a not, night like any other. The shepherds sat in the darkness watching over their sheep. The quiet darkness reminded them that the rest of the world was sleeping. Jesus is born. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Jesus is born. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. His name is Jesus. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Jesus is born, God and man in one. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Jesus has come to show us what God is like. Jesus has come to redeem us. Praise God, Jesus is born. Amen. And that's what we celebrate this day. It's what we ought to celebrate every day, that Jesus has come. The Bible just tells us that when the fullness of time had come, that God became flesh, dwelt among men, and provided for us the one thing that we were going to stand in need of more than anything else throughout the course of our life, and that would be a Savior. And that's the Son of God, Amen. the Lord Jesus. So, so we rejoice today, and we, we, we want to celebrate His coming and, and His birth uh, in this service today. You join with us, if you would, please, as Brother Eddie leads us in a couple of Christmas songs as we sing together. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all the nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. Oh, 
and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. When did the Bethlehem night, the shepherds on the hills, the song of the heavenly host, the scene of the baby asleep in the manger, when did it become the narrative we cherish today? Mary had stored all those memories in her heart for so long, and Luke must have listened in wonder as she recounted every detail. But they couldn't have imagined how every word would lead us back to the manger each year to fall in worship.
hope that you are here to adore the Lord with us because that's why we're here to worship our Lord together and uh, we're going to keep singing some Christmas songs together we've got two or three more and then Brother Steve's going to come Oh come all ye faithful joyful and triumphant oh come ye oh come ye to bed come and behold him born the king of angels oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ Lord sing choirs of angels sing in exultation oh sing all ye
at thy birth. Next is, uh, we often sing it after uh, Christmas, but Brother Steve's preaching about the wise men today, so we're going to sing it today. <clears throat> we three kings of Orient are bearing gifts, we traverse the far field and fountain moor and mountain. Headed to Children's Church this morning, you meet Miss Bonnie.
your Bible to Matthew, the second chapter. Some of you are already there. And if you are, flip back in the Old Testament to the book of Numbers. Numbers, the 24th chapter. And I want you to see a verse that appears there that is a prophecy of what we're going to look at this morning, or at least a portion of it. In Numbers, the 24th chapter, there is a, the, the word oracle appears, and an oracle is pretty much just the same thing as a prophecy. And, and in that 24th chapter of Numbers, it is the, the, the fellow doing the writing, and it's his fourth oracle or his fourth prophecy, and you see his name is Balaam. And you say, well, how does Balaam play into this story? Well, Balaam is he's certainly not the prophet Isaiah who gives us that wonderful prophecy of the Messiah who's going to come some 700 years before the fact. But hundreds of years before that, just, just to prove a point to, and, and I don't believe God was proving a point here, but I believe that God is showing us something. And what God want, needs to show us today is he is in control of both the just and the unjust. God is in control of both the good and the bad. When, when, when we get over into the New Testament and we read that passage of Scripture that tells us that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. It was the Roman world. And, and we know that he, he was not what we would call a godly man. But God used him to fulfill his purpose. Well, here in the book of Numbers, he uses a man by the name of Balaam. You say, well, who in the world is Balaam? Well, long story short, Balaam is a wicked, wicked prophet. But while he was a wicked prophet, he was not a false prophet. There's a vast difference in being a wicked prophet and being a false prophet. Because in being a wicked prophet, God spoke to Balaam. And here's what God said to him. And here's what he writes. I'm just going to read one portion of the 17th verse. But Balaam writes these words. He begins writing this fourth oracle in the 15th verse. We're not going to read that or the 16th verse, but here's the first half of the 17th verse. Balaam said, I see him. Now, if you turn to it, what, what is the first letter of him? We know it's an H, but it's a capital H. So we know that he's not just talking about that Balaam sees Keith or Balaam sees Larry or Balaam sees Lois. We know that Balaam sees the Christ some way, somehow. He said, I see him. But he said, but not now. And then he said, I behold him, but not near. And then he said this, he said, a star. And stars capitalized. So we know it's not just the north star or the evening star or even a constellation of stars. We know that he's talking about there is one. And Balaam says, I, 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 a star is going to come out of Jacob. Well, when we get over into the New Testament and into this passage of Scripture that we read today, we know that, that this star is not being prophesied any longer. But this star, Jesus, is, ha, has come. And this morning, here's what I want to do. And if, if you've gone to church most of the Sundays leading up to this, we've, I know that we here, we've already talked about the preeminent Christ. We've, we've used the Luke 2 portion of Scripture, and, and I'm sure that you've done the same if, in, in your church, if this is not your church. And we've done all of those things. But this morning, here's what I want to do. And I want this message not just to be a Christmas message, but to be practical. Because if we preach something and it's not practical and if it doesn't help us, uh, we, we hadn't done a lot of good. So I want this to not only be a Christmas message, but I want it to be a message that helps us. And I believe that it fits every one of us in this room in this way. 
We have all begun a journey in life. And we have begun this. I thought of this this morning as I, was, I pulled an annual out of, my, out of my cabinet behind my desk and graduated in 1981, and you can flip back and you can find the class favorites. And, and in the years preceding me, I've looked in my dad's yearbook and different things, and, and they had all the class favorites. Dad went to Huntington High School, and, and they had Mr. and Mrs. Huntington High School, and they had the most likely to succeed and the most likely to do this, that, and the other. Well, well a lot of times in life, those who were figured by people to be the most likely to succeed did not succeed. A lot of those who were the favorites in a class, they didn't wind up being the favorite in life. And, and a lot of times as we've, we've begun different journeys of different things, some of you have begun a new job and you thought when you began that job it was going to be the job that was going to end all jobs and you were going to reach a certain place and it didn't play out that way. Tragically, a lot of people have begun marriage. And they stood in a place like this before God and all the witnesses that were present, and they said, we will stay together until death do us part, and it didn't work out that way. So in life, sometimes we begin the journey of following a star. And in following a star, just like these wise men, they had the anticipation that they were going to find a king. And they did, but it was not the king that they were expecting to find. And he wasn't in the place that they were expecting to find him because we know that their first stop was at King Herod's place. And they inquired about this king. Well, a lot of times in life we begin these journeys and they don't play out. So here's what I want to give you this morning. What does a wise man, what does a wise man or a wise woman do when they follow a star, but they end up in a stable. What do we do? We learn the lessons on what we do from these wise men, these magi that the Bible talks about. And you see, well, you can see them right there in the corner of that, in the lower left hand to me, corner of that picture. There's three guys that are riding on three camels, and they're headed toward the city. Well, there probably weren't three of them. We just attribute it to be three because they came bearing three gifts. So we just assume, and, and it just fits into the narrative a lot better, and it's a whole lot easier to gather up three wise men for the little Christmas program than it is the probably the 300 that probably came that night. Because the Bible says that it not only did it trouble Herod, but it troubled all Jerusalem. And I don't think that three wise men would have troubled the entire city. I believe the number was in the multiple hundreds of people in this great conglomeration of people that were following this star. And, and this star led them to a place where they, didn't, they really didn't expect to end up. But here's what happens in this passage of Scripture. Now, it, 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 as you know in Scripture, as Matthew begins, we get the genealogy of Jesus in chapter 1 down through the 17th verse, and beginning in the 18th verse through the remainder of chapter 1, we get the announcement of the birth. And then Matthew, he begins to speak, and he says this, now, after Jesus was born, in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born the king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Now, why was he troubled? Because Herod didn't want competition. Herod wanted to be the king. And in Herod's mind, there was no place for any other king except for him. That's why Herod's troubled. And this says all Jerusalem is troubled with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, Herod inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And we find that in Micah, the fifth chapter and the second verse. But he says, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Well, then Herod, 
Now, let, let me, let me uh, don't, don't close your Bible. Herod's family, okay, they would have been akin to the mafia. Everybody know the mafia in our, in our culture in our day? Mafia, if they don't like you, they just put out a hit on you and get one of, the, one of their gurus to go and take you out. Well, Herod's family was akin to the mafia. And, and Herod, if he didn't like you, he'd just have somebody go out and take you out and, and, and those sort of things. So, so here's what Herod does. In verse 7 it says, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time that star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Now we just know that that's not what Herod had in mind. Herod wanted to do away with this king because Herod wanted to be the only king. So verse 9 says, When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with, his mother, with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. This morning, let me, let me give you what wise men, wise people do when they follow a star and find a stable. Here's number one. They look for God there. Wise men look for God when they find a stable. Now, the, the wise men, most of us know this, they don't get there the night that Jesus is born. In fact, it, 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 it could be upwards of a couple of years later. They have gone from the stable, from the cave, wherever it was that Jesus was born. They've gone from there, and they're now in a house. Jesus is a year or two old. And they have come looking for the king, and, and now they, they come here, and it's not what they expected. They have come looking for a king. That's why they stopped at Herod's house, because the most likely place to find a king is in the house of a king. Well, when they get there, and, and, and they begin to look around, and they begin to find out that things are not what they ought to do, it, it poses a question. Well, what are we going to do? We, can, we have a choice here. We can, either, we can either just go back where we came from because things are not working out like we thought they ought to, or we can do what? We can look for the, we can look for the Christ child. We can, we can look for God in these, in these stable experiences of life. Wise people, wise men, not wise guys, wise men of every age, of, of all of those things, when they're handed a less than desirable circumstance, and we all have been there, have haven't we? And I don't mean to burst your bubble, but we'll be there again one day when we're handed a less than desirable circumstance and things just aren't playing out the way that we thought they were going to play out and the way that we assumed that they would. The thing to do is not panic and run. The thing to do is to look for God. You say, why do we look for God there? Because, because he has promised us something. If you are a born-again child of God, the Scripture says, and, and, and you remember all these things about his promises? One of his promises says this, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. And the Scripture says that he is not slack concerning any of his promises. So when we're on this journey and things are not going the way that we thought they were going to go, they're not playing out like we thought they were going to play out, a lot of, and I'm going to tell you, a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians cut and run. They panic and run. That is not the thing to do. The thing to do is to look for God because God is there. Because he promised us. Now, we can look around us and we can say, well, where are all my friends? 
Where's all my friends that, that told me, oh, brother, when you need me, just let me know. I'll, I'll be there. I'll never let you down. And then when the, when, when the bottom falls out of life and we begin to look around, where are they? A lot of times they're nowhere to be found. But I'm going to tell you, according to the authority of the blessed Word of God today, it doesn't matter where you wind up. It doesn't matter where your journey takes you. God is going to be there. You say, how do you know that, Brother Steve? I know that because we find it in Scripture, not only in that little promise, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but we can begin to go through some of the choice characters of the Bible. In the Old Testament, we read about a gentleman by the name of Joseph. You remember him? Oh, Joseph, he was sold into slavery. He was lied about by his brothers. They, 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 they sold him into slavery. He was falsely accused by a gentleman by the name of Potiphar's wife. He had setback after setback after setback after setback. But all the while, God is working in his life. And he raises him to the position of being second in command in the land of Egypt. And God sends his brothers because a famine comes back where daddy and the brothers lived. And a famine came there. And they had to come over to Egypt where, where Joseph was at. And, and Joseph seen them and he recognized them. And he made this statement. He said, you meant it for evil, brothers. And he could have called every one of them's name. Pointed his finger at him and said, you meant it for evil. You meant it for evil. But then he said this. He said, but God meant it for good. What did Joseph do? Did his life play out like he thought it was going to? I don't think it did. But when it didn't, he began to look for God there, and God was there. We, we find it in the life of, of, of Job. Job, the Bible tells us that he was a perfect, uses the word perfect, just means a complete man. And, and, and we know this about Scripture. It tells us that, that on this particular day that he is sitting on an ash heap. And he is going through the loss of family, going through the loss of fortune. He's going through the loss of, uh, of friends. And, and then his wife has told him to just curse God and die. Is it playing out like he thought it would? Probably not. But what did he say? He said this. He said, the Lord gives, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm telling you this morning, we could, we could talk about David. David wrote that 23rd Psalm. Many believe that he wrote it while he was, he was an older man. He's, he's, he's in a cave. He's kind of running from one of his own sons who's seeking to do away with him, to, to take over the, the, the authority to, to be the king. And then he pens those beautiful words that we read in that 23rd Psalm. How did he do that? Because he looked for God in the stable of life. And he found him. Then, then there's Paul. Paul spends, a, he, we know he spends a lot of time doing missionary work and missionary journeys, but where does he spend a whole bunch of time? In jail. And it's from a prison cell in, in Philippi that he writes a letter to the Christians there at Philippi. And he tells them, he says, even if you wind up in a place like this, cheer up! This morning, I don't have any doubt that if we took the time and stood in this room this morning and asked for those whose lives are not playing out like we thought they were going to, like we assumed they were going to, I, I tell you that the majority, or at least some that I know of, they could stand and they could say, even though it didn't play out like I thought it was and things didn't go the way that I thought they were going to go, even the way that I wanted them to go, God is with me. God is there in the, in the stable, in the stable of life. And, 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 and listen, that we, we have to look for God there. Here's the second thing. Wise men look for God when they find a stable, but wise men also offer their very best to God. Wise men offer their very best to God. Now, our temptation is this. When things aren't going the way that we want them to go and the way that we assume that they would go, we decide that, well, you know, God knows that I'm down on my luck, so to speak. So I'm just going to keep back the very best because I need the very best. Listen to me this morning. That is not the way that it works. 
There is nowhere, no place in Scripture. And I challenge you to look for it. I start to say I challenge you to find it, but you won't. But there is no place in Scripture that ever teaches us that we owe God anything other than our very best. I think that covers every aspect of life. We owe Him the very best of our time, the very best of our talent, the very best of our ability, the very best of of what He has blessed us with. Don't don't you just imagine? And here's the way many people treat God. Did God give us the very best? Yes. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the sinless, faultless son of God, Jesus Christ, the very best he gave to us. But yet we, God's people, we have the audacity to think that God is somehow satisfied with our leftovers. We give him the leftover of our time. We give him the leftover of our material financial blessing. We give him the leftover of our effort. We give him the leftover. Listen, I, I, th- here, here's something I don't understand. I'm talking about Christian people now. I'm not talking about lost people. Christian people. They have to stay out late on Saturday night, okay, for whatever the reason, 12, 1 o'clock. And then Sunday morning will roll around. Now, some, some come on. I applaud you if, you if you're one of those. But you know what most of them do? Well, Lord knows we were out late last night. So we just slept in this morning. In other words, we're saying God does not deserve my effort of getting up and going to his house because I was tired. Don't you just imagine. What what if you came in, guys or or ladies, either one? You came in for a meal every day, and every day you just got leftovers. You got leftover meatloaf. You got leftover whatever. And that's all you ever had was leftovers. It wouldn't take long. Now, I just speak for myself. We, we don't do many leftovers. Main reason is because we don't have much left over. You can look at me. I can take care of most of it the first round. I drink the, I, I drink the pea soup out of the, out of the bowl of peas. So we don't have nothing left over. Don't you just imagine, though, that God, the creator of this universe gets a little bit sick and tired of us giving him our leftovers. Amen, Amen, Brother Steve. That's right. He sure does get tired of it. Yes, he does. He gets tired of it. He gets tired of our leftover time. He gets tired of our leftover effort. He gets tired of our whatever little bit of money that we may have left over. I'm telling you this morning, according to the Word of God, He deserves and He requires the first fruits. If there's any night of the week that you ought to go to bed early so that your mind is refreshed and your mind is sharp, it ought to be Saturday night. Because the next morning is when you're going to go sit in God's house. And you're going to hear a word from God. And I'm going to tell you, all of this stuff of the world is not going to matter when we get to the end of this. All that's going to matter is what we have done with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And if we come to church and we sleep through half of it, we just kind of make it through the best we can. We don't bring our Bible. You send your kids to school without their school books. Don't send them to church without a Bible. And mom and dad, don't you come without one. God deserves the very best. And and wise men, even when they wind up in the stable, 
in the place where things aren't going the way that we thought they would go and the things that we want them to go, wise men still give God the very best. Remember Deion Sanders? Played for San Francisco and beat Dallas. And so Jerry Jones bought him and brought him to Dallas so he could beat San Francisco. Then he went to Atlanta and couldn't beat anybody. But he had a nickname. Remember what his nickname was? Primetime. Neon Dion was one of them, but Primetime. Called him Primetime and, and, and still do. Well, I'm telling you this morning, God deserves our prime time. He deserves our prime efforts. He deserves the very best that we have to offer him, and that's what wise men do. They offer God the very best that they have. Here's number three. Wise men look for God. Wise men offer their very best. And let me, if you're filling this out, fill out the part that is not in the parentheses. Wise men change the direction of their life. And we'll fill in the parentheses in just a minute. Wise men change the direction of their life. Now let's fill in the parentheses. Wise men, because of what happened at the stable. Because of what happened at the stable. They changed the direction of their life. Scripture just reads it this way. They return a different way. They return a different way. Now, in our text, the Scripture just tells us that these wise men, however many there were, they were warned in a dream. And, and that dream, I believe, came from God. Scripture says that they were warned not to go back the way that Herod had requested them to come back. Because remember what Herod told them? He said, when you find him, he said, come back here and tell me where he's at so that I can go and worship. Well, that's not what he wanted. But then, but then God intervened, didn't he? And God came to those wise men, or at least the leader of the wise men, and he said, hey, I don't know how you say this in God language, but if it were me, I would have said, hey, don't go back the way you came. Go back a different way. Go back a different way than, than, than how you come. A lot of times in the stables of our lives, when we find ourselves there and we realize that, 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 we are, that, that, we are, or, or that, that that's where we are, we just leave the stable, and, and a lot of times we go right back where we came from. Listen to me this morning. That, that was not, that is not God's plan. If you came here this morning and you came here and not knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it is not his intention for you to leave the same way. If you came here this morning and you are born again, you have been saved, but you're not living for the Lord. He is not prime time in anything in your life. He does not intend for you to go back the same way. How many of you ever had a pet pig? I mean, be honest, we, we've had one. We called it pork chop. It was Nicole's 4-H or FFA or something project one time. You could take an old pig, and you could take him in the house if you wanted to and put him in the bathtub. You clean him up. You could put a ribbon around his neck. You could do all of those kind of things, but, but you take that pig and, and you take him back to the back door and you said, now, now get out there and get them, pork chop. You know, where, you know where that pig's headed? He's headed back for the mud and the slop of the pig pen because that's what a pig does. And I'm telling you this morning, God does not intend for us, his people, to come into the house of God and to hear the Word of God preached, expounded upon, and explained, and then the Spirit of God speak to our heart and, and deal with our heart and life. He does not intend for us to leave and go back to the mud and the murk of the pig pen. He intends for us to leave a different way. You, you didn't hear me. 
He intends for us to leave a different way. I'm telling you this morning, God does not want us to just live a so-so, a, a kind of a, a regular old, same old, same old sort of deal of just doing the best we can to get by and all of these kind of things. He wants us to leave a different way. He wants us to leave this service this morning, not because it's Christmas, but because it's the Lord's Day, and it's a day that, that He speaks to our heart. Listen, He wants us to leave differently. The Word of God says that it is not His desire that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So what that means this morning, if you're here and you've never been saved, it is the desire of God for you to be saved. It is also the desire of God for you as a born-again Christian to live a committed, sanctified, but becoming this. We talked about this on Wednesday night for several, several, several weeks in a row for us to be becoming holy in our life. And it's not a place that we ever just get to and arrive. It is, a, it is a progressive road that we walk, and it's a progressive journey that we're on through life, and it's the will of God for we, His people, to be holy because the Scripture says He's holy. And He wants us to be like Him. One day we're just going to be made like Him. But down here on this earth, we're supposed to strive to do that. And I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of us that are Christians that we're just not trying. If you've ever taken piano lessons, if you've ever played Little League, if you've ever done in school, you have probably had a teacher, a coach, walk up to you when you, when you weren't given full effort and they just said these words, you are not trying. And I'm going to be honest with you this morning. There's a lot of us as Christians that we're just waiting for our ticket to get punched to heaven. But while we're here, he wants us to be holy. And listen to me this morning. It is the desire of God for us to leave differently than the way that we came here this morning. He said, Brother Steve, I'm already, I, I, I'm already a better Christian than most people. Well and good. Praise God for that. But you hadn't arrived. I hadn't arrived. And he wants me and he wants you to leave differently than how we came. You see, what happens in life, is, is many times God, and, and, and I believe this, you know, a lot of times when, when we get into a stable experience, we get into one of those times where we just don't understand what's going on. The first thought that comes into some of our minds is, why did God lead me here? Why, did, why, why am I here? Why am I in this place in, in life? Well, sometimes he leads us to, stable experiences to things working out like, like we didn't do. He, he does that so that we do begin to look for him. We begin to search for him and we begin to find him and we begin to long for him and we begin to depend upon him because he's all that we have. He doesn't want it to be that way just when the bottom falls out of life. He wants it to be that way every day. Every day. Some of us are here today, and the truth of the matter is, is we're really not depending much on God because we've got it under control. Well, God sometimes has to bring us to the place where it's beyond our control to remind us who really is in control. And he wants to teach us to allow him to be in control every day. So sometimes he just has to bring us to the stable and a wise person a wise person when they come to the stable experience of life 
They're going to look for God because he's there. They're going to offer God the very best that they have to give. And they're going to change the direction of their life. I don't know what it may be that God wants to change in your heart and in your life today. God knows. And I believe for the most part that we as individuals know what it is that God desires to change. If you were to ask me, what does he want to change in your life, Brother Steve? I could answer. I may not could give you every one of them, but I could give you a list of them, of things that I already know I ought to do differently. You could do the same. I don't know what those things are for you, nor do you for me. But I'm telling you, God knows. And if God, through the Holy Spirit, who indwells us as Christians, if he is dealing with your heart about something that you need to change, then you need to be like these, like these wise men and leave differently than how you came. Seek to honor God with your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this story, a story that is almost so majestic, the story of Christmas that is so revolutionary, but yet it is so simple, and it is so presentable that we're able to identify with this story and find application for it in our life. Lord, this morning, life may not be working out the way that we wanted it to, thought it would, hoped it would and Lord this morning we just we, we just need to may need to stop and look for you and Lord we know you're going to be there because you promised and then God give us leadership direction and guidance for our life and help us to follow you to leave here differently from the way that we came to honor glorify you and you alone. Save the one that's nearest hell. Draw the one back who may have strayed away from you in their walk with God. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.